we're going to talk to you today about the National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA. And it is my pleasure to have on the podcast uh, today a, a colleague and good friend of mine, Dan Kenny. Um, Dan Kenny is an attorney. He used to work directly for this office as an associate for a number of years. Uh, Dan went off on his own, and uh, Dan and I do a number of these cases together uh, because Dan is very bright, has that killer winning instinct, and Dan has traveled with me all over the United States. Um, we have gone to California, uh, North Carolina, Texas, um, places like that, all representing um, uh, employees. And these were typically federal employees. And, uh, Dan, I know we also did a number of high-profile cases um, together um, over the years. That's right, Marshall. Thank you for that great introduction, and um, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm happy to talk to you today about the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, and I know I'm looking forward to many whistleblower cases in the future. Yes, this is going to be one of the hottest areas in all of employment law. Um, and what this NDAA does, in essence, is it protects contractors, people who are not federal employees, and it gives them roughly similar protection as the federal employees. Now, federal employees who complain about waste, fraud, and abuse, uh, they go through the Office of Special Counsel and then they go through the Merit Systems Protection Board and there's an administrative judge who uh, handles the case and uh, issues a decision and if people don't like it, they can go to the federal circuit eventually, first the full board. And what happens here is this is actually a private right of action for contractors, for employees of, of contractors. And this is really, really big. Um, and what do you think, Dan, are some of the reasons, I guess, with the new administration, maybe, why would that be with uh, whistleblowers and contractors? Well, I think, I think what you're going to see over the next couple of years is the administration relying a lot on private business and private organizations to contract work with the federal government. Now, as you've seen in recent news with the EPA and a lot of other organizations, there is some emphasis by the, or, by the administration to either silence or uh, change the work or really kind of go after people that might have a disagreement with the policies of the government. And you may see that same type of behavior start to work its way into these contracting organizations um, that are working with the government agencies. It has been this public outcry uh, over the last decade or so, and really one of the things that Trump, uh, President Trump ran on was sort of kind of cleaning up the waste in government, um, and the American taxpayer is just getting sick of people wasting all kinds of money, and um, a lot of our clients are federal employees, and they can tell you about supervisors and managers who... Uh, who basically don't do a whole lot, they make a lot, and they waste a lot of resources doing that. So this is important. Um, one of the key provisions of the NDAA is that you first have to file with the Inspector General's office, the Office of Inspector General, um, and then after you do that, they may issue a report or not, but if they don't, after 210 days, you have your uh, filing rights in federal court and you uh, start um, a lawsuit. Now, a lot of cases, Dan, of course, are not set, are, are, of course, are settled prior to uh, filing ever. And what do you think in terms of um, filing with the OIG, the Office of Inspector General? Does that, in your experience, has that helped settle some of these cases? And, and if so, why? Yeah, absolutely it does. I mean, not all causes of action do you get to go directly to the Inspector General. Generally, Inspector Generals of agencies are kind of like an independent organization with the agency that's tasked to make sure rules are being followed, contractors are behaving. And when the Inspector General takes a look at some of these complaints, uh, that may affect how the contractor is able to do business with the agency in the future. 
If a contractor is having an, invest, an investigation done by the inspector general, that is going to adversely impact that contractor's ability in the future to gain a contract award, to keep its contract award, or to bid a contract award. Um, I, I had personal experience representing an employee who was working for a large contractor that was in the midst of a contract negotiation with the agency, and my client had reported several uh, instances of waste, fraud, or abuse by that contractor, and the contractor was so concerned about the bad press it would receive um, in the light of, in light of its contract negotiations, if there was an inspector general investigation, that it decided to go ahead and settle the employee's claim without going through that full IG process. And it's it's really neat because so much in employment law, if you compare it to like discrimination, um, and someone files with the EEOC, uh, it doesn't really affect the company necessarily that much. Simply that someone filed with the EEOC, and I have no doubt that many Fortune 500 companies have countless claims uh, filed against them, but it doesn't necessarily impact their business right now. But an OIG filing can, and that provides momentum and reason to settle the claim. Now, of course, the claims um, have to be real, and one of the themes that we've put out on our podcast is that the importance of putting complaints in writing. And Dan, in this setting, in, in an NDAA case, why is an employee's putting something in writing, putting the actual complaint in writing, um, important? Generally, the first thing the Inspector General is going to look to is what was disclosed, how it was disclosed, and to whom it was disclosed. And if you're representing an employee that's filing a claim with the Inspector General, and you don't have that complaint in writing, you're going to have a tough time um, convincing the Inspector General that a disclosure was actually made, convincing the Inspector General that the disclosure met the requirements of the NDAA. Um, and that you know potentially the retaliation was due to the disclosure. So my advice to most of my clients, or all my clients, is that you put this disclosure in writing so we don't have the problem when we go to the Inspector General of having to answer all those questions. The disclosure's in writing, the Inspector General can see for themselves that this disclosure was made and that it met the requirements of the law. Is there any way, or what's the best way, I guess, because on one hand, the employee, you want to complain because then you want to complain in writing as I've banged people over the head with this. Yes, it must be in writing, everybody gets that. But people are concerned. If I put it in writing, I could be fired. Um, they know I'm complaining, so there's a balance. Um, what are some of the ways um, that an employee can complain in writing, meet all the requirements of the NDAA, but in a kind of subtle way where the employer isn't going to realize what the employee has just done. Yeah, usually complaints um, under the NDA involving you know, waste, fraud, or abuse are coming in the context of something the employee has discovered, something the employee has identified while working there. So usually there's some sort of correspondence between the employee and the employer supervisor already concerning the issues that the employee is raising. So I like to advise my clients that look, if you're going to be talking about this with your supervisor, at the end of in an email or a letter or a memorandum, at the end of the letter, you know, kind of in a, in a final paragraph or in the middle of the, of the letter, identify that there's been a violation of the law. You don't have to say, you know, I'm filing suit right now. I'm going after you for all your money. Just identify the violation of the law, how the law was violated. Um, and that this potentially could be uh, something that's brought up to the IG or through any other uh, federal agency. So very important. Um, this is a, the law was, uh, ironically, it was uh, first passed in 2013 on kind of sort of a trial basis. And in 2017, which is uh, this year, uh, this podcast at least, it has been solidified, yes, this is the law. So this is relatively new, very new. So if you are a contractor, uh, you may be covered directly 
by federal law on an NDAA claim, same as a federal employee. <laughs>